Okay. Good evening. I'm Amanda Skyer, Executive Director of the Preservation Foundation of Palm Beach. And I want to thank you for joining us this evening for our first episode of Landmarks and Libations. Tonight, we have with us uh, former chairman of the Landmarks Commission, Ted Cooney, and architect Richard Sammons of Fairfax and Sammons. So welcome, Ted, and welcome, Richard. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So our topic tonight is guiding your project through landmarks. So uh, we thought that we would start with some um, philosophies uh, that guide different schools of thought when it comes to historic preservation. And so um, in preparing for this webinar, I spoke to Richard about it, and there's two primary schools of thought. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Richard, to talk about those two different schools and how um, those impact how you approach a, a preservation project. Okay. Well, you know, preservation and restoration have, have been around since the Roman, Roman times because actually the Romans would restore things, uh, particularly Greek monuments. Uh, so it's, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a, a new concept. But in modern times, uh, it preservation comes to, comes into uh, use basically with um, Blatier, who was a French architect who did the restoration of many of the monuments in Rome, including the Arch of Titus. And his his methodology was that you would try to differentiate between what was old and what was new. So, for instance, at the Arch of Titus, he would replace rotten stone and put back new stone, but the new stone contrasted with the old stone, so that you could tell what was new and what was old, uh, as if that was important. Uh, the only problem is, it looks great now because they're both aged, but before they aged out, it kind of looked like a leopard, you know, with spots all over it. And so the point is, he was all about trying to make sure that you knew what was new and what was old. And that's... That has sort of uh, uh, been taken up by most American uh, preservation school as important. And it's been actually enshrined in the Secretary of Interior standards in, in section nine. We'll get back to that later. The other notion or school of thought really is more the English notion. And that is, you don't really care whether you know whether it's new or old, you just want it to be pretty. And uh, it actually comes more or less from both Rustkin and Ville Le Duc at the same time. If you know that Ville Le Duc's spire on Notre Dame, they're trying to decide whether to replace it, replace it or put a new one on there. Well, he built that in the 19th century and it was never the spire from Notre Dame, but he built it in a way that looked like it was built with the, originally with the building. They built in the style and spirit of the original work. And that is the kind of way I was taught at the University of Virginia, and which is a holdover from Williamsburg, where you kind of build things that look nice, that fit in, in the style and, and, uh, and spirit of the, of the original work. That also harkens back, of course, to Alberti and the notion of the second architect. We don't need to get into all that. But so those are there two conflicting mindsets. One is you have to, if you're building an addition onto a historic building or for altering a historic building, it has to be obvious to everyone that it's, that it's brand new. Uh, and then the other one is you can do it, but you do it so that it fits in. A scholar would know that it's new or anyone who looked at it closely would know that it was new or, or thought about it but it didn't jump out at you and beat you over the head and tell you that it was new. Um, so those are the two schools of thought. And uh, actually in, in, uh, in Palm Beach, I think we are more like the Virginia school. Let's make it pretty first and then we'll worry about whether it's, you can tell whether it's new or old <laughs> later on. And if I could jump in for a second, um, you know, the, the strict, strict interpretations of the um, Secretary of Interior standards that uh, Richard uh, referred to earlier would often have something so stylistically different. And you see that in some of these classical buildings with an extremely modern addition. Um, 
in, in some cases, well executed. I, I think in many cases, not very well executed and sometimes to the detriment of the original historic structure. And um, Richard was correct. We've, I think in Palm Beach, historically, we've almost developed a bit of a hybrid model between the two where you don't need to deviate completely from the architectural style of the original building, but there's ways in hierarchy and finishes, hierarchy of scale, uh, windows, and some architectural finishes that you can differentiate the old and the new without having such a jarring contrast. And I think one of the most uh, effective examples of that and one of the most visible is um, the town hall structure in Palm Beach. Um, the original buildings were designed by Harvey and Clark, uh, West Palm Beach based architects who designed uh, a number of historic structures. And they were the north and northern and southern structures. Uh, and I believe it was in the 1960s, John Volk did an infill addition to the town hall we all know. And driving by, you wouldn't know that there was a motor court separating these north and south buildings and a radio tower there, but there was. But the town needed more office space and Volk constructed this central wing, which is different from the other wings in that it has a bit more smooth instead of rusticated stucco and a slightly different window configuration. And, and the, the whole works but still allows someone to look and see that maybe the structure changed over time. So, you know, I think there's a healthy medium, a way of achieving what everyone's talking about too. Definitely. And I think that um, also in preparing for this talk, uh, one of the things that we talked about is um, some of the labor costs involved in, in a, undertaking a preservation project. And while we're talking about materials and what types of materials to use and, and how to approach a project, um, what are some of the uh, ep economic um, factors that people should be aware of before they embark on a project, a historic preservation project? I guess that's for me. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's a that's a big question, um, and it all it all depends on how you go about the uh, restoration. Whether you're doing a restoration, you're uh, replacing part of the building, or or whether you're um, doing an addition to a part of the building. There's all different things, but the the biggest issue really is that if you do a restoration or, or even renovation, it's always more expensive than building new. And it has nothing, to, it, it's counterintuitive, but our labor costs are so high that you have to think about somebody taking the building carefully apart and then putting it back carefully together. So it's almost like twice the work of simply just doing it the first time, putting it carefully together. Um, so yes, restoration and, and renovation of things are expensive, um, but there's a, there's a value to old materials as well. And that's something, again, the English understand uh, that there's, there's a patina to old work and there's embodied knowledge in the old work, which if you, even if you try to replicate it, you probably are gonna miss a few things or a lot of things. And oftentimes around town where they've torn something down and said, oh, we're gonna replace it exactly the way it was, you kind of go, yes, I think that's, you know, maybe theoretically that's possible, but in practice, it's never the same. You've lost all the all the feeling and the character, the patina. I mean, the the, the and you and the architect makes all kinds of silly little mistakes about the depth of something or how it's put together is slightly different, and it looks wrong. It looks fake, and uh, you know, I, I mean, some really good architects can do it, but it, in practice, no, it's not. It's not a. It's not really possible. So uh, I don't know whether I got off on economics or not. From a green standpoint though, saving old material means that all that carbon and energy that went into building that isn't thrown away and, and, and then having to be replicated with new intensive 
energy that gets embodied in that building. There's there's actually kind of a, a carbon and energy um, embodied energy sort of uh, bank in a in a building. And if you if you flush all that out, you've emptied the bank account and you got to fill it back in. It's wasteful, you know. And yes, the dollars and cents are one thing, but also the environmental cost of throwing a building in a dumpster and then trucking all kinds of new material to the site and putting it together with power tools. It's, it's, it's environmentally costly. Well, I think it's often said, sorry, I'm sorry, Richard. I think it's often said that the, the greenest building is the one that's already built. And that's something that's you know frequently said about historic preservation. So I think everything that you said about um, about how the buildings are um, and full of embodied energy. Uh, the other point that I, I wanted to make was I think a lot of the building materials that were used even a hundred years ago, you're not able to find anymore. For instance, um, first growth uh, wood. Uh, from forests, there's many of those trees uh, don't exist anymore. For instance, um, Dade County Pine is something that you can't purchase anymore unless it's been uh, salvaged from a building that's been demolished. Exactly, and if you're trying to replace a wooden element, and you're replacing it with new wood, and it's not a tropical hardwood, it's probably going to rot. Um, so the original, this comes up with a lot with original windows, which for some reason everybody pitches out the window. Um, you know, the, all these houses in Palm Beach have had these, the wood windows that they had are either old growth cypress or old growth pine and they will last forever and can be repaired over and over again. And we typically throw those out and replace them with a wood window that might last 20 years. So <laughs> it's, it's a kind of a, and that's in the, in the name of having hurricane, uh, you know, but most of these houses had normal size windows that could have shutters that actually closed and things. Um, Ted? <laughs> I think you guys have this subject covered. Amanda, what do you have? Uh... <laughs> well, do you then, Ted, do you want to talk about some of the benefits of landmarking? So we've talked about, you know, some of the economic challenges of labor costs and uh, replace, finding replacement materials. But can you uh, talk to us a little, a little bit about what are some of the benefits that are afforded to landmark properties in Palm Beach? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd start first with just an overall benefit um, to the community because um, I believe that existing as part of a community is one of the things that um, we should all strive for and one of the things that makes Palm Beach in particular um, a special place um, and that the entire value and of, of the town is enhanced by Palm Beach's preservation of historic resources, homes, structures, natural resources, and vistas. Um, that Palm Beach is unlike any other Florida community is because we've managed to protect these assets. Um, and it creates in Palm Beach a sense of place that has been alluring to people for well over a hundred years and continues to be alluring. So preserving that sense of character um, makes Palm Beach a, a special place as a whole. And that's a benefit that's afforded to everyone and everyone who lives uh, or works in town. For individual property owners, um, there's a number of benefits and, and I know we're working on, on enhancing this uh, benefit suite. Um, one of them is, one of the most significant is um, in, in light of, of uh, concerns about sea level rise, historic properties receive FEMA flood exemptions. So an addition can be constructed to an old home without having to raise the home. You can do substantial work on a home without having to raise a home. Um, and you can also retain access to flood insurance uh, by, by way of this um, exemption. Um, there are historic properties that choose to, historic property owners who choose to elevate their structures. Um, and that can be a, a, a whole nother subject in and of itself. Um, one of the other main exemptions is um, some flexibility with the building code. And um, you know, a strong preservation program, usually uh, it's imperative to have a strong relationship with your building official, which we do. 
uh, Wayne Bergman, the acting director of the department and, and the town's building official, understands historic properties. He is understands the reasons that are uh, in the building code for granting exemptions. So for instance, uh, you could have a historic railing that no longer meets the uh, code that requires, means you can't pass a three inch sphere between the railings. Um, you're able to keep those on historic structures. Um, you're able to keep a lot of original features and staircases that, that couldn't even be reconstructed in a new, new structure that add a lot of charm. Um, additionally, the town, um, the town and county participate in the state's tax abatement program. So properties that undergo substantial restoration work can achieve tax abatement uh, for uh, qualifying improvements. Uh, that's all determined by the tax appraiser's office. So it can be a bit challenging to quantify in advance of the culmination of a project. Um, but particularly with projects that add some square footage to a home, which typically seems to be one of the triggers for an increase in, in your tax assessment, um, it can be a substantial savings uh, to a property. Heck, anyone I know would take any sort of savings on property taxes. Um, and these are savings that are transferable with the property as it sells. Um, so one property that comes to mind to me is a, um, you know, landmarks come in different shapes and sizes. And uh, there's a lovely cottage bungalow at 159 Australian immediately behind the police station. And a nice couple restored it with uh, local architect Tom Kirchhoff. Um, they were able to make substantial improvements to a 1920s cottage or maybe late tens, I can't recall, um, that really needed the work to modernize it and make it a livable home. And then they also demolished and rebuilt almost in kind the accessory structure with the garage and a carriage house apartment. Uh, and they did that as a tax abatement program. Um, this nice couple ended up deciding to move closer to family who had some needs. So they sold the home but the new purchaser was able to reap the remainder of the year of the 10 years uh, and, and just took that, assumed that automatically on purchasing the property. Am I missing anything? I think you got everything, Richard. Is there anything okay. you'd like to add? Um, why would you restore something? What are the, what's the benefits of having, of, uh, of, well, not only community, um, and it's true that Palm Beach looks the way it does because we've, we've kept things from, from changing. So has Nantucket, so has Venice, so has many places that you'd want to be have all gone, have, have protected their, their older architecture. You know, Palm Beach could look just like Boca if we let things just roll off the, off the drawing board uh, without any review and uh, you know, it wouldn't be wouldn't be this anymore. Um, personally, there's some satisfaction in, in having an older house with history uh, versus you know something that is brand new. And there's lots of quirky things about old houses which you think you can't live with that you after you have lived with them you kind of understand why it was that way and you begin to like it. So before you kind of do an alteration simply because you don't think you're gonna you could live that way try it for a while <laughs> it 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 you know maybe uh, the the first architect on that job had a good idea um so i mean there are all kinds of great benefits to preservation it improves property values i mean if you're if you know that a house next door cannot be changed substantially. You can't tear it down and put up a, a, a Boca McMansion job. You're, you're, you feel more comfortable. Your property is actually worth more because you know that's not gonna happen. It's like when you have a, a piece of property beside a nature preserve. That's a, that's a plus because you know somebody can't build on the nature preserve. And knowing that your next door neighbor can't build a, go tear the, the old house down and build a really ugly house or even a pretty house that's gigantic is a plus and it adds value to your own property. Um, not having to bring things up to code on, on a landmark property is also a huge savings. And uh, because most of the modern codes 
are are there. They're there for our protection and somewhat, but a lot of them overreach and are, are in aggregate kind of ridiculous. Um, so, you know, the, the four inch spear uh, between um, between pickets on a, on a railing had to do with the fact that one time it, it, the, 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 uh, the myth is, the urban myth is that a baby had their head caught in something that was uh, wider than, than, uh, than four inches. And I don't know whether that's ever happened again, but all the, ch all the codes changed. And it means that traditional ballast rods and things like that are actually illegal. If you the ballast regulated out of existence, <laughs> they've just regulated out of existence, and it's kind of a you know, so there's all kinds of things that actually are illegal on old buildings that you can keep that you cannot actually do on new buildings. Uh, a stair that isn't enormous for one is, is, is one, uh, all kinds of things. Well, I think, um Definitely, there's a lot of uh, benefits to preservation, and thank you for going over all of those. And I also think that was excellent advice um, to have people, when they purchase a new home, try to live with it, if possible, for a little bit um, before you decide to make changes. Because there may be some things that, after time, you become more comfortable with and, and more used to, and then might be open to keeping them. So I think that that's really good advice. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch on that I'm not sure that everyone is aware of is the difference between architect the Architectural Commission and the Landmarks Commission. And we, you know, we touched on uh, the, the fact of how design review, it really enhances the beauty of Palm Beach and ensures that a certain standard is maintained. And um, I think that both of you are, are now on the Architectural Commission, so you can give us um, some pointers on how those two commissions work and, and some of your experiences with them. Well, um, if I, you know, I can, I can start off and talk about landmarks. Um, which I served on for 10 years and eight as its chair. And I've just joined uh, the architectural commission uh, with Richard, which he's served on before. So he's probably better able to um, address. Um, but um, Palm Beach has, you know, almost a bifurcated design review system that if you're not historic, you go to the architectural commission, or if you're historic, you come to the landmarks commission, but everyone has some level of design review. So, it's important to note that being a historic property doesn't add an additional layer of bureaucracy within the town of Palm Beach. That's not true in every community, but it is here. So you would have had some level of design review. You're, if you're a landmark or historic property, you're just substituting that review at the Architectural Commission with a review at the Landmarks Commission. And um, it's a board I know very well and am and, and very passionate about. I was sad to leave. Um, but um, I know that some, there's something about historic preservation and landmarks commission review that has a bit more objectivity than many design review commissions. Cause you're not looking at a piece of dirt and imagining what might come out of the ground. You're really looking at an existing historic structure and you're evaluating whether the proposed changes, additions, modifications are appropriate. So appropriateness is always that lens through which we look, which I think helps narrow and focused discussions onto, you know, character defining features and important things. So um, that's always helped uh, guide our discussions at the Landmarks Commission. Um, I know one of the big fears property owners have um, is that extra bureaucracy and being told what they can and can't do with a home. But by and large, being landmarked largely just means that you can't demolish your home. Um, I have seen projects of all shapes and sizes in the 10 years I served on the commission come through from simple renovations with no square footage change. Um, before my time on the Landmarks Commission, um, Richard's firm did a, a sizable uh, restoration at Il Palmetto at 1500 South Ocean Boulevard, a Maurice Fascio home where they constructed sizable square footage additions enlarging the home greatly while still retaining its historic character. 
Um, I've seen homes elevated. Uh, I've seen homes in, in one meeting, one time I, I recall, this was a project done by Jeff Smith um, on Banyan in the estate section. And there was a beautiful Marion Sims Wyeth historic home with a unfortunate later addition. And often you'll find on these old homes, it's the older additions that kind of muck up the, the good original design. Uh, and once you kind of strip back in sensitive additions, sometimes the home starts to begin to make sense. So what Jeff and his team did was they decided to completely remove the insensitive addition and they replaced it with things that brought this 1920s uh, Mediterranean revival home up to a modern standard. They were able to add uh, a modern kitchen that wasn't a staff kitchen. These old homes tend to have staff kitchens. Uh, now families live in and interact in their kitchen and dine in their kitchen and spend time in their kitchen. So that's a need. Uh, the old homes often had rooms for staff where a family might still have some staff, but it's not a live-in staff of eight. So those rooms become guest rooms uh, and guest suites for visiting children and grandchildren as families grow and create some more casual living spaces. So I recall that house on Banyan Jeff was able to achieve approval to demolish and replace for his client in one meeting. Uh, it just took one meeting because the plan was well executed and thought out. And the home now lives on and is able to serve a more modern purpose while still being respectful of the uh, past. Um, and the other thing I'd add about the Landmarks Commission is, um, and the program as a whole, is that I would encourage everyone to kind of take advantage of, of the resources that are out there, um, both within town hall and the planning, zoning and building department, the town employs historic preservation consultants who are here to serve residents and property owners and are happy to take calls, have co phone conversations, email site visit with property owners who just might want to know what they could do at a home or at a home they're looking at. Um, the, the planning, zoning and building departments really working and has been very successful at um, improving customer service and outreach with the community. So that's a resource that's there without hiring someone. Um, and then furthermore, the, the residents and members of the Landmarks Commission, all but one are required to be residents of the town. So we're members of this community, uh, we're engaged in the community, and, and I know we all participate in this to kind of give back and be available. So. You know, my phone would ring, I'd be happy to reach out to people, provide advice, come talk to them about something. And then in addition to that, there's not-for-profit organizations around. Obviously the Preservation Foundation here in town, um, they're wonderful archivists, um, can help you find information, history on your home, uh, plans, old photographs. You never know what they'll have. And that's, you know, just a phone call away um, the, the foundation is a full-time archivist in charge of um, all their records. For, for a number of architects in town, they have old historic drawings. It can be fascinating what you can turn up in there. Um, the Historical Society in pa of Palm Beach County has some information as well. And even the town's building department has old uh, electrical plans, <laughs> floor plans, drawings. Um, we actually have fairly good records. So there's a lot of resources that I think uh, a lot of people should take advantage of before they allow any sort of concern to overwhelm them. Definitely. And that was actually um, one of my later questions. So I'm glad you touched on it, <laughs> researching your property. And I think yeah. it's important for people to know that uh, the two um, nonprofits that you mentioned, the Preservation Foundation and the Historical Society, each have different architectural collections. So depending on um, what who designed your property, um, you would go to one or the other. But I, I will advocate for the foundation that we're a good starting place to determine the architect if you don't already know the architect. Um, and then we also have the architectural collections of um, Marion Sims Wyeth, John Volk, Belford Shoemate, and Henry Harding. And the Historical Society has Addison Meisner and Maurice Spasio. So that's um, a, a good place to start, definitely. You have um, some Fascio stuff. I've been in your archives. We do. We have a okay. little bit. Yes, we do have some. But for, for sure, the lion's share is at the Historical Society, but we have some as well. 
Um, and Richard, so would you like to talk about the Architectural Commission? I mean, Ted was saying that yeah. landmarks, you can get your project approved in, in one meeting. How often does that happen at the Architectural Commission? Oh, never. <laughs> uh, sometimes, absolutely. Uh, in a, the, the Landmarks Commission is a lot easier to get through than ARCOM. And it's because ARCOM, it's an open, it's a, it's a tableau resin. You can, you can, it's open to all kinds of criticism because it's brand new. It's new and never before seen, so everybody has an opinion on it. And it's, it's a free for all. And at Landmarks, it's really just, they've got, they, the design is already there and you're, you're altering it in some way. It's a lot easier to make, to make, uh, to come to a consensus on something like that as a group, that this is a good idea. Uh, you've got, you know, I don't know how many people on the commission at any one time, uh, and everybody has an opinion and, uh, it it can be a you know the ARCOM is is a really tough a tough uh, you know group um, and you know doing something new you're not you're if you're you're doing a historic restoration or in addition to a historic building you've got something to go on if you're doing something new you the architect could be making all kinds of ridiculous mistakes uh, architecturally and. <laughs> You know these kinds of things come up regularly, uh, so it's it's uh, if if you if you buy an old if you're if you're contemplating building a new house or or restoring an old one, uh, restore the old one <laughs> in this town anyway. Um, but uh, you know, so Arcom I, I consider to be the far more difficult uh, commission to get through. Um, well, and I think, um, so we, we touched on um, how documentation can really help your project and, and helping it uh, get through landmarks and receive approval. So certainly doing your research ahead of time is, is really good advice. Um, what in terms of, as a landmarks commissioner, former landmarks commissioner, what are some things that you're looking for in an application when it comes before you? Um, well, the best projects are always informed by uh, good research. Um, I think it helps you understand a historic home, um, and it certainly helps inform decisions about how best to uh, change it. As, as I alluded to before, um, a home that's now 100 years old could have had several owners, several renovations, and several different rounds of changes. So sometimes you're looking at a jumbled space and trying to make sense of it. And a lot of people might not be able to wrap their head around it. More times than not, I've seen architects and homeowners come together and find the most successful outcomes for their projects based on digging into some research about either the architect or, or even better, the particular home and finding original features that either have been lost and restoring them or recreating them or using those as guidance for the changes and additions that get done. Um, and as Richard mentioned, you know, spending time in a space helps you um, understand it better. Um, the most, your question was about the most successful projects. Um, you know, I, I, again, the, you know, research really informs a, a thought out project and um, also good research is a good, selling tool in, in getting your plans approved at a board. You know, it demonstrates to the board that, that you've done your homework, you've really thought about this, and then you have somewhere to point to, um, you weren't just making something up as far as an addition, you have some historical context and some, some guidance that, you know, informed how you chose to approach the, the project. Um, the best, the best sets of drawings we get are filled with old photos and old drawings. And uh, you can see a progression from original drawing, existing drawing and proposed drawing on one sheet of paper. Um, and those, those projects tend to sail through an approval process um, just, because, just because of the amount of thought that goes into them. 
Richard, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that? I'm, I'm thinking of one project that comes to mind that you had historical documentation of what the original facade used to look like. Oh. And you use that to inform the design for, for what you ultimately ended up receiving approval for. Are you speaking of Dying Golf you? Yes. Okay. Um, see as you're talking if I can try to screen share. Okay. Well, to, to tell you how reasonable Landmarks is, uh, this is a nine golf view, uh, if you can see it, if it pops up on the screen. Um, anyway, it's, it's a house that was originally a Spanish house and originally a, a, a kind of addition to us. And it had a bad kind of renovation in the late 40s, early 50s, which basically turned it into, well, it had a giant, plate glass window and it had a kind of a New Orleans railing on it and it was just a complete uh, uh, strange amalgamation and uh, landmarks allowed us to completely alter this facade. This facade was completely changed and it was returned to a style, returned to not the original facade because this was actually the side of the building and the, and the front door was around the side. Um, the, um, are, is, is this actually, are you see, showing the shared screen? People are actually seeing that? Okay. I, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so we completely changed it. Everything is, is, is changed here. Uh, the plate glass window becomes two arched windows. The front door gets a new door surround. It gets a parapet on one side and this uh, balcony on the other. And this is again by uh, Clark who did the, the city hall. And actually you can see that there's the reverse composition of the city hall with a little tower going on there. So I was trying to work within the, you know, get into the mindset of the original architect who designed it and come up with a scheme that would have, that he may have come up with if, if he had had the front door on this side. So. Um, so Landmarks is very, is, they will work with you. They'll work with you uh, a lot more than, uh, than if I tried to build something new, it's harder. Right, and Richard was able to, to you know, demonstrate for he and his, his client before the board that the proposed design, he, through research, he was able to show that, you know, the existing, the home that existed was not the original home. And he was also able to, to make his case to the commission that this home, this home and the improvements of uh, many of the homes on Golf View Road got chopped into pieces over the years. Um, that this, this home could better fit into the streetscape that was truly a 1920 subdivision uh, built all at once. Um, and I think it's a great improvement on the street. Well, and that's a great lead in to the next project we wanted to, to talk about, speaking of being chopped into pieces. Um, one of your projects right now, Richard, is 16 Gulf View, uh, La Claridad. Can you tell us a little bit about that project? Well, yes, this, uh, this is a, a, a house that actually was much larger. It was actually connected to the, the next door neighbor and was, um, cleaved off, I think in the 40s or 50s, and turned into a single, uh, its own house. And uh, what we are doing here is trying to, it had a, this is the side that actually didn't have the living room, that had the dining room and the kitchen and the servant swings. So it never really worked very well as a house. And the servant's wing got rejiggled three or four times to try to make it into a, a more livable uh, part. And we ended up simply taking the servant swing down and rebuilding it. Um, and then- I think then, I have an image of that. And then decided to restore the rest of the building. The front of the building is a restoration of the, of the very kind of strict rest, restoration. And then the rear of the building is actually a completely new structure here. And it doesn't look very attractive right now, uh, but it will be, don't trust me. Um, and this was a section that had the, the, 
the servants' rooms and everything else. And usually the, those areas are not as well constructed. This one actually had different windows. It's had kind of cheap sash windows originally uh, versus the, the nice casement windows on the on the old part of the house. So it was actually treated as if it was a, you know, almost a back house, a lesser part of the building. And so in order to, you had to bring it up to, to, to bring it part of the, make it now part of the house, you've got to bring it up to the same standard of, of, the, of the front of the house. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, so that's really the, but it will be more attractive than that, trust me. So this, is the, this is the kitchen and there's a garage on this side and, and somewhat. See if I... Um, Well, yeah, and that's going to be an excellent um, project for the town of Palm Beach. I mean, when I when I toured that home with uh, the design team and the owners, and um, you know, as 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 important as having a strong professional team is to a, re a historic renovation project, having having great owners who see the vision um, always results in the most successful projects. And I think some of that this case, just we've got a great owner. Being, yes. Yes, you 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 have you have owners who 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 get it through and through and saw through the potential. And just to you know, I'll highlight that when I first toured uh, through the home with the owners and the design team uh, in advance of our landmarks meetings, which are allowed. Florida has pretty broad open government laws, but you're allowed to meet individually with members of a board uh, and review a project with them. So particularly on historic homes, I found that very very helpful because you can see what's wrong with a house, what needs to be done and what, what, what they're trying to achieve. So I believe it was, a, it was a really hot afternoon. It was probably in the summertime and the home had no AC and um, was in terrible shape. The additions uh, Richard referenced um, that were later than the original home, I think dated probably to around when after it was split and when the previous owner did work, but were hodgepodge um, and a lot of it wasn't really usable since it was a fragment of a home. It, I think they had been an attempt to make it more useful, but the home was in such bad shape that uh, somehow a stray cat had found his way into the home and had interrupted our, our site tour. Um, and this is a home that uh, probably most buyers would have been terrified to have gone near. And with a good design team and a good contractor and an owner with, with uh, the vision and patience to see one of these through, this home's going to be when it's finished, um, a stunning home and one of the great historic homes on the island. So, definitely, and I and I just want to add that um, this house is actually the subject of a documentary that's going to really explore the restoration process, but also the architect Marion Sims Wyeth and some of the personalities that have been uh, associated with it. And so that will be coming out in the fall of 2021 alongside the first monograph of Marion Sims Wyeth's work that the Preservation Foundation is going to be publishing. So just had to get that little plug in there. <laughs> so um, I, I think we've covered um, two projects, but just to show the full spectrum of preservation projects. So these have been an example of how flexible the Landmarks Commission is. I wanted to bring up, Richard, your project on Sea Spray, that uh, amazing Moorish revival house that you're working on right now, because that's really a, a really pure example of, of preservation and restoration. Can can you, can you speak to that for us? I don't have any images, unfortunately, but. Yeah. Well, that's, it's a, it's a funny house and it's a courtyard house that you live around the courtyard and it hadn't been changed a bit. It had the original, it has the original furniture in it. Some, much of which, which will be uh, reinstated. Uh, hello, Anne, you're, you're oh, on, you're on sorry. candid camera. Um, the, <laughs> so it, it's an example of something where it's really, a, a, a uh, it's a it's a pure restoration, but in in reality, what it is is doing all at once ninety years of deferred maintenance. So all we're doing is cleaning it up and making things actually work, and the windows to actually work, and they're not painted shut anymore. And uh, so we're it's we're making it new, but we're doing eighty years of deferred maintenance in the, in the process. Um, you know, there was a new kitchen, but it's in the same place. 
the dining room's in the same place. It's it's not really altered at all. And I think it'll be interesting when it's when it's finished because um, and again, this is one one where the owner, you know, it's it's a completely foreign concept to, to live in this sort of courtyard house. But now that she's been working on it for a while, she kind of sees how cool it is that, you know, really the living room is this courtyard in the middle. And uh, so it's, I think it's going to be an interesting project when finished, but that's a pure restoration. And uh, Il Palmetto, for instance, was a creative reconstruction. I mean, we turned a 42,000 square foot house into a 72,000 square foot house. But the house actually came all the way down and was reconstructed the way it was and exactly the way it was. And so it can be done. It just is very expensive and you've got to have somebody that really does catch all the nuances of the original structure. Um, so the three those are the three uh, extremes. <laughs> well, and I also wanted to end on sea spray because I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, tax abate, the tax abatement program. And there is a, a special application for that and a certain order of doing things. And so I was hoping you could speak a little to that because I think that um, sometimes people are discouraged by the, the paperwork or the process that's involved. Um, it is a multi-step process, so I was hoping you could just provide some guidance on that. Ted, do you want to start there? Yeah, I'm, the tax abatement does, it, it's something you need to initiate from the, from the get-go of a project. It's not something you can uh, go after retroactively. So it's something you need to know you want to set out to do uh, as you, before you begin work on the project. And you need to your project needs to be declared when it goes through the approval process that the changes that you're seeking approval for will be requested for tax abatement. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. Um, it's just so that the, the commission can make sure tax abatement projects tend to be looked at at a slightly higher standard than every other project, largely because of the notion that if, if you're going to be receiving relief from your tax bill, um, we're going to ensure that the project's at the highest standards. Um, and in tax abatement projects, uh, we reference Secretary of the Interior standards, um, and we also review the one of the only are the only case in which the the commission reviews some interior changes. Um, all landmarks commission normal applications are only concerned with the site and exterior architectural changes, um, and those can include a courtyard in courtyard homes but not your interior rooms and your finishes and your fireplaces or anything like that. In a tax abatement project, um, we do review and have jurisdiction over the interiors and largely the precedent that the board has, has had for, for many years since the outgo of the project is that we look at principal historic rooms that are kind of character defining to the structure. So those are gonna be, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of a 20s Mediterranean house, it's gonna be a living room and a beautiful mantelpiece and the beamed wood ceilings and columns and original architectural features that you would see on the inside. Um, bathrooms, bedrooms, kitchens have all kind of been understood to be spaces that tended not to have major character defining architectural features and that you were pretty free even in a tax abatement project to improve as you saw fit. But maintaining original features in the principal, you know, public rooms of a home um, has, has been part of the review process there. And then th this, you know, there's guidance that can be achieved, can be had through um, the preservation consultants for the town of Palm Beach. Uh, they coordinate the paperwork between the applicant and the town and the county and the tax appraiser. So they would be the best resource um, should one be interested in that process. Well, it's definitely a process that's worth doing and uh, it, it mostly because you know some Palm Beach taxes are, are kind of crazy uh, but you know and the but the Secretary of Interior standards are the Secretary of Interior standards and you have to follow them uh, but the town of Palm Beach usually is very lenient on on the strict that on the strict approval but you know it's not just the town of Palm Beach that we have to, at that point, um, uh, satisfy. It's the county and eventually the state. Uh, 
in some states. So, and then oftentimes again, Shippo, points, Shippo doesn't get involved in ours. Shippo so, doesn't get involved in, in Florida, but in most in states our, it no. is Shippo. Yeah. Um, and and again, the clients oftentimes are reacting to an interior and think it all has to be changed, mostly because the decorating is, you know, 19, you know, is somebody's grandmother's decorating. And, and all the architectural details usually go into the background when you change the furniture and the colors and things of that nature can change a room completely. So that's why I'm saying don't rip everything out before you've actually thought about just changing the decoration a little bit. Um, and again, and you, Richard, to, to that end, I've, I've seen someone whose personal taste tended towards the modern uh, and, and they kept all the original architectural features in a home and um, their personal decorating taste was slightly more modern. And even within that context, they were able to juxtapose some more modern pieces of furniture and art in a historical context without hurting the history of the structure. And then when someone, you know, as they're just temporary stewards of a historic structure, the next property owner could come back with completely historically original furniture should they want. Um, but they're, they're able to do so as long as the original features are retained. Modern decoration in a historic building works very well. They play off of each other. And uh, sometimes when you have a modern interior uh, in terms of the decoration and a modern building, you know, there's nothing to play off of and it's, it's a little paler. It ends up looking more like an airport. <laughs> than anything else. Um, and there's, exactly, I mean, the, the building should be the building and the interiors of the architecture of the interior should go with the building, not with the, the furniture. The furniture you can always change, uh, but the architecture is costly to put back. Well, so we, we've talked about, you know, researching your property, um, preparing your, your application and materials. So now your project has gotten approved, hopefully on the first try. And what are some of the things that come up during construction and how are they handled? I mean, there are things such as board approval and staff approval. So Richard, what are the, some of the things that you run into um, during construction and what would trigger you having to go back before the board or to seek uh, staff approval? Well, most things that you, you run into are, uh, tend to be something that needs to be uh, repaired for a structural reason or it's completely rotten or there's mold in there or things of that nature. And that doesn't, that, that completely is, is you know, just simply done as part of the project. Uh, sometimes people want to move a window here and there and um, or or change minor things uh, which still go along with the concept that was approved and that would tend to be held dealt with in staff approval but when you try to do too many of these things at once or you're making a di a diversion from the con architectural concept of what was approved then it gets kicked over back to um, the commission. Um, and so staff was fairly lenient, particularly with, uh, with uh, Josh Martin was at a, was a very, he wasn't stupidly strict, which uh, a lot of commission, a lot of, uh, of, of uh, bureaucrats can be. Um, and things move very smoothly. I don't know whether we're going to get back, whether that's going to stay on as a legacy or not. Um, but typically, staff doesn't want to. Staff has, in the past, been loath to approve something and would rather have it go to the commission. Um, but and that's the, is that the same with Arcom as well? Yes, exactly. I mean, and I can. I can speak a little more to that on particularly with regards to historic properties and the landmarks commission because the ordinance that governs uh, historic preservation in the town says that administrative approvals are done with uh, concurrence of the chair. So I was involved for eight years in every staff or administrative approval. Um, and 
staff was kind enough to give me, you know, a good deal of, of deference in some of these matters. And um, I always looked at it through the lens of, is this the kind of thing that's going to end up at a commission meeting? And everyone's going to say, well, this isn't obvious. Why, why, why do we make them go through a 30 day filing deadline, notifying their property owners and slowing the project down to have them here? We're going to talk about it for 60 seconds and stamp them with an approval. Um, so it's, so we tried to take a common sense approach um, and those, each of these administrative approvals were reviewed with me, staff and our consultants, uh, typically on an email chain. And more than nine times out of 10, they were minor requests, the kind of simple things that come up in the course of construction. If it was something structural that like Richard referred to, we might do a site visit with the building official just to see with our own eyes that there was in fact, you know, a concern that needed to be addressed. And typically those were life safety kind of concerns uh, that a new structure needed improvements to make it secure and livable for the future. And if they were minor enough requests, they, they got dealt with and, and a permit issued straight off. Um, it was very few and far between that if my gut told me I wasn't sure about something, I'd cautiously just bring it to the board. And then usually it'd get happen anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was one other thing that I wanted to um, mention about um, tax abatement projects, specifically when you get to the end. Um, there is a completed work application that needs to be filed. Is that correct? As built, yes. And, and yes. Built. And does that go back before the board or is how is that approved? It, it, Ted? No, that, yeah, um, yeah, the, at, at the culmination of a project, because the taxes, tax abatement saves you not just from the town's taxes, which I believe are roughly 18% of your tax bill, but also from many other taxing agencies. Uh, you don't get savings on the school district and, and uh, I believe one other, um, but you get a savings on the, but the bulk of your taxes are paid to the county. Um, so the county need, the county commission needs to sign off on these. So the, the documentation needs to be sent up to that level. But that review process is handled by the town with the town's building department and a final walkthrough with the historic preservation consultants. who are basically going to compare the drawings that we gave you the green light to go ahead with, with reality and confirm that what you said you were going to do is what you did. And so I guess that speaks to um, the the thought that it's always a good idea to put a lot of um, time into researching and thinking through what you want to do with a property before going before the commission for approval so that you can uh, minimize any oper any chances that you might have to go back. Yeah. Well, I, I think we, we covered a, a lot in the, the past hour. So I'm, I'm happy with everything that we covered. I hope it was a, a good introduction and that we gave some practical advice. Is there anything that we missed that um, came to mind while we were speaking? Not that I can think of. I'm just grateful for the most social interaction I've had in three weeks, so. <laughs> Well, Thank next you. time, uh, we definitely want to do these again, and we, um, and I for neglected to mention the Q&A feature that Zoom has. So hopefully, uh, for the next one of these that we do, that we can have some people send in questions that we can answer. But I certainly encourage you, if you have tuned in today, to please send us ideas um, for future topics for us to cover. We definitely want to continue this series and also I welcome you to send emails or uh, comment on social media if you have any questions and we'd be happy to answer them and be in touch with Richard and Ted and I do see um, that Renee Sylvan has raised his hand is what it says here so let me see if um, I can hmm I'm not sure how this works okay Let's see. Okay, I'm going to allow you to talk, Renee. Renee, are you there? Renee, you're on mute if you are there. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes. yes sir. 
Hi, Renee, welcome. Hello. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank the three of you for doing this. It has been extremely useful to me and to I'm sure anybody else who's listening in. So kudos to preservation, thank you, Amanda. And the two of you were dynamite. Every time I listen to you, I learn so much. My, my question is, uh, there has been a lot of talk recently about creating another level of protection, which is historical buildings. Could both of you please, could you Richard and, and Ted talk about what your feeling is about that and if it has evolved since you first heard of it uh, as the town has started to speak about it? Thank you. Ted? Yeah, I, um, I think I think what Renee is getting at is is there was a um, a push to broaden, um, as we mentioned earlier, that FEMA exemption for the floodplain elevation. Um, it, the, the planning, zoning, and building staff made aware to the town and to the town council that there were many homes that were older that someone might want to make some improvements to, but because of the requirement to elevate a structure most of those were just getting torn down and replaced and not not rehabbed um and so this idea came up through staff of creating a separate category i think they were tentatively calling historic buildings i don't know if they settled on some final language but that allowed a structure of a certain age to receive that same exemption um and those might be a structure that may not be worthy of being landmarked or of where someone wanted to make an addition or some improvements. And the end goal of that from staff was to keep as many um, older structures in town as possible and, and incentivize renovations, even of non-landmarked properties as much as possible. Um, and I had some personal concerns about this um, initially. Um, largely, I didn't want to disincentivize anyone from being landmarked. Um, there's already, in my opinion, some unnecessary fear of being landmarked. Um, and typically, once a property owner gets through the process, they're happy they've, they've, they've come through the Landmarks Commission instead of ARCOM. Um, but upon some further thought, um, you know, I think the idea has some benefit. I talked to a few property owners who were wanting to make some improvements to their house and finding that to add a simple like uh, dining room addition, they needed to step it up by two or two or three steps, which just seemed unreasonable. Or to add a bedroom for their growing family, they had to make some complicated structural changes um, or be faced with tearing their house down and start from scratch. Um, I know this is still navigating its way through the approval process. Um, some of this language needs to be cleared with the state, um, and I'm I'm not certain um, since I've left the board and everything's been going on. I I have not heard any updates as to where it lands as far as the approval process um, with the state. It it points to a deficiency in in our whole landmark laws that is different than say Europe, particularly Britain, in which there are different levels of landmark protection. In Britain, you'll have a grade one house that you can't change anything, the interiors, whatnot. A grade two, which has a little less, uh, you know, concerns. And then a grade three house is, is historic uh, and, and could receive, for instance, a waiver on, on the uh, having to come up to code and FEMA. Uh, but it doesn't have the same scrutiny that a grade two or grade one house would. And, I always always think that we need to have levels of because you know something that's landmarked, you know, is it uh, Il Palmetto that's landmarked or is it a little bungalow over here that's landmarked? Which one has, you know, they're treated equally as if they both have the exact same value, and we should be able to take that make value judgments within what's landmarked. Right. There's always that you know uh, you know the the landmark program and the designated historic properties in the town run run a full spectrum of, of different types of structures from, you know, humble beach bungalow cottages to grand historic estates. And um, sometimes when, when we were attempting to protect some of Palm Beach's simpler history that I think is, is important to protect and helps tell the whole story and uh, is character defining, we would get pushback saying, well, well, this is just a cottage. This, this isn't a, 
Mar-a-Lago or Il Palmetto. Um, but, you know, that, as, as you alluded to, there's, there's all sorts of levels that, that deserve some sort of historic designation. And, and, and yeah, you're right. I think this is a, an attempt to kind of incentivize preservation of all types of structures. Thank you. And, and I think that um, sea level rise is certainly going to be a challenge uh, for Palm Beach moving forward. And it's important that we do use all the tools that we can and, and explore all of our options. So I really um, commend the town for creative thinking on this. And I hope there's some way that we can also look to add additional benefits to the Landmarks program, as you mentioned earlier, Ted. Took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, Renee, did, did you have anything further or any additional questions? I think you're the only one that was brave enough to, to raise your hand. Uh, well, no, I don't. I just want to close my part of this by saying that there's a French expression, which is that someone has forgotten more than I will ever know. And that applies to both Ted and to Richard. Your breadth of knowledge is always breathtaking. Thank you very much for, for doing this for everybody. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Renee. And, and I think that's a, a great um, note to end on. Thank you so much, Ted and Richard, for your time this evening. I think this has been a great conversation and hopefully helpful to everyone who has been tuning in this evening. We have recorded this and we'll be making it available through our website. So please share with your friends and family if they were not able to join us. And we look forward to seeing you for the next episode and our landmarks and libations. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for hosting. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye.